I'm here to tell you a little bit about, uh, uh, not my life, my life story more or less, about uh, what we did and what we still do with the plants. So this is uh, where we live. So the fact is that we bought a very old farmhouse in the middle of, of in the east part of the Netherlands. Uh, me and my wife, we moved from um, a normal um, a sort of suburb um, in the western part of the Netherlands to a countryside east in the east Netherlands, close to the German border. And we bought a derelicted farmhouse to start a nursery, to start growing our own plants for our designs. Uh, we, uh, in fact, we didn't really know what we were starting because it was really hard working the, the first 10 years. But here you see the trial garden we uh, put up. So it, we had about three, uh, let's say one and a half hectare and we started in the front with a trial garden and with a small little um, nursery in the back. But uh, what we did, because we knew that there was a, a, a we had a big need to find plants for our designs. Most plants in the nurseries were were not the plants we were used to uh, to uh, to use in our design. So uh, we wanted more robust and taller plants and plants that uh, had some impact and some uh, uh, presence in garden design. So alpines and so on. Although I don't mind alpines at all and and lower plants or plants that. Uh, but it was not about only commercial plants. It was about plants that we could reuse in gardens. They, uh, that they, uh, but this is our trial garden. This is the trial garden now. So we moved it into a garden. You see it's, uh, it's completely different from what we uh, did in the early ages, uh, the early ages, the early uh, stages of our career. So this is the maturity. Uh, just give you a little overlook of our garden, so uh, it looks wild, it is not wild of course, but this is how it ended up. This is our, how our nursery looks now. It is uh, uh, turned into a sort of half wild meadow where we interspersed perennials into a wild sown grassland, uh, starting with camassia in spring. I think in a month's time they will flower. This is, these are the perennials that we put in the garden that, and see how they will compete with, the, with, the, with all the things that are already there. So the wild grasses and, and the sort of very uh, strong uh, competitors. But we put something strong against this. So most of the plants you see here are very strong and can compete with most weeds and all the, all, all the things you don't want in your garden. Um, the inspiration, the inspiration, um, yeah, how does inspiration come? First, um, yeah, uh, uh, it is your personal uh, idea about what you like and not like. We were uh, used to English gardens, which we visited a lot and we liked, but in a way we, we thought it was, uh, yeah, uh, once you understand how um, English garden design works, you want to go on. Uh, yeah, you don't want to sit still when you're uh, whatever at the end of your 20s and think, okay, this is it and this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So also the world changed. You see the last uh, decennia, we had another idea about gardens. We, it's, uh, you know, we use the word sustainability nowadays and durability and that we um, don't want to spoil uh, too much. And also in that context, uh, we changed our ideas. So we traveled a lot, you see. Maybe it's not good, but we deck out hellebores in uh, uh, the former Yugoslavia because they, they burned them, the cows wouldn't eat them. So in fact, you see, they went around them. So it was good that we, uh, uh, we met a lot of people here uh, on, on the lectures we did in, in um, the Northwest Pacific. You see Dan Hinckley here with some other, Roy, Roy Lancaster climbing up a rock and uh, having a beer at night, so it was very relaxed and uh, not so complicated, but in fact, by, uh, uh, you see the connection plants and people is undoubtable important. So you meet a lot of people uh, when you are really interested in your uh, in plants and, and, and travel and put a lot of, we put a lot of em energy in it. So my wife ran the nursery at that time I went more into design, so I, I just, uh, my first commission uh, next to uh, and that we uh, already did some private work and, 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 and I was working in Europe, in England at that time, but my first commission uh, was a competition in, in, in 
Uh, my first commission in America was a competition with uh, w which we won. So I came, I had to travel and I had to find out whether the plants we had in mind for that area, for the Lurie Garden, if they would uh, work. So I met people from the prairie restoration organizations. And that uh, was a completely different world. So people were just uh, recreating prairies, not by just burning and plowing and so on, but just recreating them over a longer period. And you see, um, yeah, I was already interested in plants, not only for their flowers, but also for uh, their personality, their character, and even for what they, uh, for, for what they did after. Met other people like Rick Dark. We went to uh, this big uh, plants in, in um, Pittsburgh, you know, with uh, they, they, uh, direct places, but with uh, a yeah, sort of uh, overtaken by, by weeds, uh, uh, beautiful weeds or whatever. It, they are not no weeds, of course, but they, they are plants that just uh, uh, est established there and, and created their own beauty for that area. So they're trying to, um, all these old factories, they, they try to, bec they become an, uh, 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 like in Germany, they become at the end uh, places to keep instead of to demolish. Uh, traveling uh, in nature makes also that you see patterns and patterns you re you you recreate in your own garden. So you see plants that you see I can use with other plants together to create a similar feeling. Not always wild. I think the trifolium you see here is a wild plant, but uh, the samsia in general is also wild. But this is a cultivar. Um, uh, uh, Seeing prairies the, uh, at the Morton Arboretum gives you other ideas about how you could do gardens, also very uh, sort of simple, with just one or, or a few species. So it, 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 it also tells you when you work a lot with plants that it not always has to be complex or complicated. You can do it simple, but to do it simple you need to know your plants. But if you use the wrong plant it can disappear within two years and then you have a problem with your client, uh, but yeah. <laughs> you see uh, autumn, autumn color. Uh, uh, gives, uh, this is the pine barrens in in, uh, in New Jersey, but also you can see that back in your own work. If you uh, uh, look at plants, not only for for what they do during the flowering period, so. After flowering, uh, especially when you work in public or maybe, but also I think in your own private garden, it's good when you look at plants more carefully. Don't see your garden as some as a household where you have to clean up everything that is just uh, dying. Uh, and then planting design. This is a design I did for a private garden. It's it's uh, it's more conceptual. You see, it's not groupings. It's not about plants it's a sort of concept where where we work with a you know i will tell that later groups and matrix uh, yeah okay today landscape architects are more involved in architecture uh, uh, um, the urban design and public uh, infrastructure instead of with real gardens and plants i don't know whether it is like that in sweden but in general it is where i work so it's more it, plants are more on the second is the second part of of the the profession and students, um, a lot of students, they are looking at very famous architects, landscape architects, and they forget about the plants that we uh, we all have in our mind when we make gardens. Uh, and today, um, uh, when, w because of television and media, gardens are uh, our ideas about gardens is more about uh, decoration and and. Uh, um, and it moves on trends, so it's about we need this for this year and that for, uh, f uh, we need more than only plants in the garden. So, so and public design in the public uh, areas is not, an, uh, it's not underrated because uh, you s you, you're here, has a lot of people, it, you can see that there's a lot of interest in plants and, and people that work with plants. But it's complicated. It is became more and more specialism. Like in the past, that everyone was busy with plants all uh, 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 during a study for more than 50% uh, of his study, and uh, you went to arboretums, you worked there, and so on. Uh, and then you became a landscape architect, and you knew your material. But uh, nowadays, you know your material, but very superficial on the on the bottom, on the on on on, on a uh, superficial level. So planting design, uh, what I see in parks and in public is that 
it uh, yeah it it uh, it should create a relationship between people and their environment in the context of of the world that is changing fast um, and uh, if we talk about planting design today to create this real a more natural um, idea of, of of where they say okay it's it it uh, it's more based on ecology. Uh, that's what you try to do. So no, the plants are not wild. The plants behave very well. That is one thing. But by intermingling and mixing, you create this sort of natural effect. And that is where I, I, fo I focus on. Or fa uh, that is what I do a lot today. It's more complex, but it looks more naturalistic. But you see the consequences when you do that, when you like you see the first picture, that is, uh, yeah, there's a need for uh, a bigger plant knowledge and, and more, uh, um, yeah, um, or plant ecology. And so I, I, what I think is that, uh, in, uh, especially on larger areas, on uh, urban uh, plantings, we need more cooperation with ecologists and so on to see how we can create a, a, a less maintenanceful, uh, of let's say public space is about maintenance, of course. But how can we create something that's more more durable uh, in in public, so that we accept it more, or that it's more into the budget of of uh, of, of local governments? So planting design is all about context, local context first. You see, it's an English house or, or a smaller house. So it's not about it's it's about your house and where you live. This is a country house or a city. So that is uh, everything is context. In 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 when you start designing, you have to be aware of that that you cannot do what you do at home in a city uh, or or in a neighborhood. Even in a neighborhood, it needs to be a place where people will want to be or uh, want to go to. So it, uh, context is is important and the environment of where you work. Uh, whether it's uh, in in the south of Spain or on a beach or in woodland, uh, they're they're all different. So um, and we all know that. But uh, it, it's that. But if you talk about complexity, it is complex because next to that you need to know what will grow there, and you cannot on a larger. Uh, yeah, areas you cannot just do an experiment. You can do an experiment in a smaller garden. You say, "Oh, I try this, and we, you know, I like this plant so much. I need to, I want to use it." You can do it, but but don't force it. Uh, scale is important. So whether you work work on a, a say 50 a, a hectares, or you work on one hectare, or you work on a few hundred meters, uh, you see, everything has to do with uh, what you have in mind. Once you st start working, this is, uh, even a small garden it has its own sort of uh, um, approach. Longevity, so how long will the park stay, has to do, um, of course, uh, if we talk about perennials, we don't talk about trees. Trees, are, of course, are, are you know that's I think uh, it's the the main structure of all public areas where you work. So trees are very important. Shrubs are important, but I think perennials are very dynamic. So um, and that's why it uh, has appealed so much to people because it changes so much. Every day is different. Uh, so, but the longevity. You see uh, strong plants. Uh, big gestures, but it is all about the lifespan. How long will a, a garden stay as it is, or stay uh, um, uh, in a way that you can be on top of it, that, you, that it is still controllable? Because design is controlled by, by, by definition, so otherwise you don't have to design. Uh, so you have to be, uh, you must be able to bring it back. So coherency, also something that I think is. Uh, is uh, one of the main things that it has a, an order, a uh, logical order, and a re relationship between the plants. So you see, there's a sort of sometimes it's about rhythm, it's repetition, uh, but a certain, that, that should feel logic. Like here in this is uh, a part, I think, or was it uh, Alabama? So you see the, the, the roads where things. Well, just complexity, look at this, yeah, it's hardly to complexity, sometimes you can control, 
but it's hard to control because you let things go. But even if you let things go, you should be aware that you that it shouldn't go out of hand, that it can become less or more, and but it still stays good. So mingling plants, that you never know what is going to take over, but if one plants take over, you uh, you must be aware of that before you start designing. Uh, seasonal interest, which we all know is important, because you make gardens that uh, you want to walk in, uh, not only in, in, in uh, August, but also in February or March. So. I think uh, uh, the first signs of, of new growth are important. Um, your little places in woodland uh, with, with the variety of plants, or uh, sometimes not even a big variety, but it is important that there's something to uh, be aware of. Even in June, where you have this sort of little aspect plants, plants that flower in June, but probably disappear later. Uh, summer, uh, with the abundance of only flowers. And autumn, where you say that uh, structure becomes more important, flowers less. So it's structure, character, and uh, skeletons. So, and you must, I think you should open your eyes for, for also things that are not probably... Uh, uh, that probably they are still attractive, but not seen as attractive in the past. So signature, that is uh, what happens when you uh, do everything right. So you create something that people recognize and say, okay, that must be a garden done by so-and-so or him or her. This is uh, our garden, some of my work in general. And then experience, you don't get it uh, right uh, the first day, uh, you can imagine, not even the first year. And after uh, 35 years, uh, you, still are, uh, you still are surprised by, by what, you, uh, what sometimes happens. Because you you're, uh, keep on being eager to make something that is, you know, you, you want to evolve and, uh, and, and make it different all the time. And you know you can't make it different. You can make it look a little bit different. Still, uh, it is hard to find new ways of gardening. I think it uh, needs decades to change from one uh, uh, way you uh, work into another complete different uh, 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 sort of picture you make. But experience is important. You see that people need to know their plants. They need to. Uh, it often happens then when you are on on site when the when when your plants come there that the, that the contractor doesn't even know the plants that you have to say oh this is that that is that they don't recognize it even if it's in flower and that uh, so gardeners are uh, I think my, uh, the most gardens that we make are uh, depend on on gardeners so it's not about what we do it's all about gardeners that that take care of it and, and know what they're doing so. Um, we often come back on, on um, you see nurseries, working on nurseries and botanical gardens can do a lot of good that you learn to know your plants. And then when you make gardens, it is important that you evaluate, that you come back, assess the garden, say what goes right and wrong. Because I have never made a garden that where everything went right. And uh, never made a garden where everything went wrong. So that is also, uh, but there's always something going wrong. But you see, we uh, we uh, we bring up the team again and we discuss what goes wrong and right and and say what they. So also, um, I don't mind if uh, some people have a better idea, but if it's not better, then I I just do what I think is better. But if it sometimes it's even better than I had in mind because I work on so many projects that. Uh, uh, I, I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm very open in that. So plants. So we have trees and shrubs, primary plants. So that's the plants you start with. If you use trees and shrubs, you start with those. Uh, and of course, it's too many, too many beautiful trees and shrubs to neglect them. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there's a lot of trees that go well together with with perennials too. But in a way, it depends also on, on of course, on the, on, on the uh, commitment, uh, the brief, uh, how you start. Then we have, what did I say? We have this sort of primarily plants where we can also reckon 
some perennials, robust perennials. They are a sort of elementary plants where you can start with to build up uh, your design. Then there's uh, low and mid accent plants that are just uh, smaller and lower that you can use into a sort of basic planting that pop out, out of your matrix of grasses. You see, this is a garden in Nantucket. Or some shrubs you can... Uh, And the matrix, uh, there's a mis uh, sometimes it's difficult to... Uh, I know that maybe six, seven years I, I just I came across the word matrix by people that used it so often that I was just wondering what is it. So matrix is so... Uh, it's, it's the way we, we use on, on larger areas just, just to cover more or less ground where, and then use other plants to go uh, come up out. Uh, but the cephitis is a rounding substance which, uh, within which something else organizes, so uh, develops. So it's a basic planting where plants can come up out. Okay, you can read it. It's, uh, but I will show you what it is. So it is uh, a basic planting, like uh, you can use a grass or a perennial as a basic. Let's say if you have tiarella or, or you have a grass like lucula, all the plants that emerge from that. Uh, emerge from the matrix. So the matrix we call is a sort of basic uh, planting where all the plant, other plants come out of. You can see it here. There's a grass called Sporobolus. It's uh, a North American grass that uh, is becoming more and more popular. It, it's scented. Um, I tried to use it in Sweden here, but they, they, till now they say it uh, probably... Uh, yeah, I have no good uh, comments on no one has used it or tried it, and, uh, but it should be tried at least in the south of Sweden. But it's very hardy, it's very tough, it's long-lived, it lives uh, forever, it will uh, survive yourself. But here you see it used as a matrix, but the matrix can also be different, various big groups where other plants come out. So. So planting design is also about, it's not only about plants, it's also how you position your plants in your design. So, and I always say, I don't want to look at plants on the, uh, from only from the, from the outside. Uh, so you don't create borders where you can't go into. So what I think is important that, uh, yeah, that you, you can walk through your planting. So, and I have a certain width that you, uh, that I say it could be seven meters or ten meters, that you just cannot overlook it. So, and, and that every, uh, that sort of distance I create, try to create a path. And uh, I've noticed that, I learned that in Enshirping, that uh, the park is very small, rather small, but by cr having all this sort of path that go across the planting, it feels if it is much bigger than it really is. So people go around it and through it, and then at the end you don't know, you, you, uh, you have constant a different perspective. And that works very well. Uh, so this is how I start, just to give you an idea of, of uh, how I scrabble. I struggle sometimes. Uh, there's two ways of, of there's different ways of planting design, of course, that uh, traditionally block planting, as we all know, is what what we still do, and I still do, is very traditional. Uh, it makes that you can just uh, control. You know the group is that big, it's that particular plant, and that's it. If it grows out of control, you can bring it back into proportion, and it may be not easy, but you can bring it back to what it was. So block planting is, is uh, also, f uh, if you, with, with less plant knowledge, you can just control it because you can bring up your drawing, uh, talk with other people and can bring it. So that's block planting. You can see how it looks in the winter. Uh, this is how we plant nowadays and even we put this on design. So a block plant, this is more intermingling. So it's more, it looks more natural, of course it feels more natural. And, uh, and uh, so in that sense, uh, but it feels already better, even in the winter, when you come out and you see this or this, then you know that yeah, that it uh, has uh, it's more spontaneous. So block plant. So you can do a block planting with individual plants that come out, that uh, already creates more tension, more depth. 
or here in Chicago, we can see this, uh, this also block planting. And this is my first attempt to a more conceptual planting, a sort of meadow where we use a certain variety of, of a certain number of plants in, uh, in, 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 in the context of, the, of this, or in this matrix of uh, sporobolus. So there's uh, whatever, Arinthium, there's Baptisia, they all come out of the... Well, but that, that is my first attempt, but uh, drifts. You can make drifts, so I've done this in, uh, I was at in, in Wisley. So where we um, have certain drifts that go from uh, from the top to the bottom, the, every drift is a variety of four plants. Those four plants that uh, they they uh, uh, cover uh, the season. So four plants, there's one plant in that combination that flowers probably in, in May, the other one in August, the other one in September. And then you can repeat this. So you have this combination, you can repeat it here, and you can repeat it here. So it's not that every drift need to be the, the same combination. It's more that every combination has, or every drift has something to cover the seasons. And also that it should be in a nice context, a contact with, or let's say in a nice, uh, way combining with the neighbor drifts so that uh, you see that it is uh, not a drift where the next drift has a, a similar type of plant so in fact it is uh, i started this it was in Wisley. it was uh, when i started it i thought it was a good idea but it was uh, very difficult to make the picture work for myself this is the more co um, yeah sort of um, this is when i started to create uh, this sort of uh, in public space in rotterdam uh, more uh, starting with a, a matrix, so that is, if you see the big open space, it's one particular plant, and then we have groups that inter inter interfere in that uh, sort of layer of plants. So this could be Molinia, and then we have this uh, irises in patches that come in, and we have some taller plants, or, or some uh, early flower plants, so you can put your uh, earlier uh, uh, flowering plants into it. But uh, you see, every every uh, drift has another sort of combination, and altogether, when you are on eye level, when you walk uh, through the garden, uh, you will probably see it different than from above. For sure, you see it different. You don't see the pattern so much. You feel more the the, the sort of perspectives and the dimensions. Here, this is Cheryl Holman, if I say it good, but uh, this is uh, the park in, um, um, I did with uh, Stefan Matson a few years ago. I think it's now in its becoming mature. And um, uh, uh, Stefan will talk about that later, but I think it, uh, it worked well too. But you see, it's a, a circular. Uh, every circle has its own sort of combination and, and it's in the context of the other circle with a combination. Uh, but when you walk there, you don't see that much. You need to know the design before you notice. So layering. So as you see, sometimes when you work with uh, a matrix or with trees and shrubs, you need more than one paper to make it clear for yourself. So you start with your trees, then you put your trees under another piece of paper and then you start to to create your uh, the, the perennial layer and then you keep your uh, uh, let's say the plants that don't like stress from trees keep away from your trees so you move around with your planting a bit in the way that they will uh, not be uh, stressed after five years by the trees that grow up it's not always true it will happen at the end so after 10 years you have the problem but then uh, I think that it's uh, gardens are not forever huh? In fact, they're very ephemeral. They will uh, things will change in time. So that's uh, again about the matrix. So it evokes a situation in many natural habitats. So that's what it does. And this is how we did it uh, in layers. You see the trees. Show you again. So you see the trees. That's the first layer. Then this is the, the this is the matrix. The matrix is uh, four or five different grasses in groups, in larger groups. And then you see all the plants that are individual plants that are put into the 
uh, sort of uh, 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 ground covering grasses. Another idea, so you see a field of Molinia with interspersed with groups of uh, Artemisia, groups of... Uh, um, I don't know if you can see it, but it's all different plants that uh, that that move through this larger um, area of of one individual grass species or variety. You see, and on the top we have some block planting. Here you can see this. So you see, this is Liatris. We have Sporobolus. We have Artemisia. We have some Amsonia, Baptisia leucanta, Echinacea, and it's all put in this matrix of Molinia. It's a large uh, yeah. transferring the planting design. So when you uh, have done it, so it's that you have the drawing. I would say that we put the planting design on the ground. It's not. We don't do it when we do a border or about. Uh, which is small because then you can you have to reference, but it's because you lose reference if uh, references when it is a bigger area. So we put the planting design on the ground and then we just uh, bring it down. So then the projects. I hope this is clear. Okay. And if it's not clear, you'll get it right in a few years' time. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, you see, this is Anne Sherping. Uh, just I start with this, it was my first public uh, work. And I always say it was, I, I mostly worked in of, uh, for, for uh, offices or private people. And this was the first uh, project outside uh, sort of the public, uh, the private uh, atmosphere, public. It worked well. I, I made a lot of little mistakes here. And they forgive me. But the park is still there, <laughs> thanks to a lot of gardeners. Huh? You see, it's it's open to the public. But um, it, I'm I'm glad I did it. It was uh, also my, my what I say my first real important work, and it happened in Sweden. Then we went to also in the year 2000 in, in Penstorp, also a meadow where they wanted to create something uh, more than. Uh, it is, uh, was a nature, uh, not a nature preserve, a bird, bird uh, uh, sanctuary where, where people could go and bird watching. And the owner got some money from a lottery and wanted to change this into a garden that related more to the wilder landscape. And I always say, yeah, what I do is not wild, but some people have the idea that it, uh, it, it is pro probably it's more dynamic and expressive and it reminds you more of wild plants. In fact, it is not. But this garden is still here after 13 years. So if you say, normally I would say 15 years is good for a garden, for a perennial garden, then you really have to make your big changes. But if you make them during the way, then you can keep the garden uh, for much longer. I'll just let you see some uh, combinations. If it needs exploitation, then I will do it. But uh, this is just for to see you how uh, how you how it works through the seasons. You see that, and still, uh, of course, uh, everyone knows now that you don't cut your garden back in, uh, in, uh, in in October. That at least you leave it if it is beautiful. And the Lurie Garden. This is uh, the, my first major garden in, in America, where, which we did with Gustafson and partners. We won a competition on a roof on a roof of a garage. It's uh, I think it was one and a half acre. All the design, and here we I copied the uh, the river of uh, Antwerping. Again, it's the, f the last time I did it, I th because it, it was such a success in Antwerping that I thought, now why not? And you see it uh, in a different city, it works different, but it's still what it is in Antwerping. So I always tell uh, Stefan, uh, I won't do it again. <laughs> and I, I never did it again, because I th but you see, this, it, it works. It is a seasonal aspect, it works in the month of June, the end of May, and it tends to flower um, Easier 
later in the season again. So it repeats flowering easier than with us in Europe. Uh, you will be amazed at how plants react that probably don't do well here, do very good there and the other way around. But uh, you learn a lot through uh, all this, uh, to work in, by working in all these places. You see, this is uh, Baptisia. So this is the meadow, this is where my first trial of creating a sort of uh, um, meadow type of gar a garden with the native Baptisia leucanta in combination with some allium, Christophe. This is winter. Okay, the battery was the second, and I was working on the battery in New York. You see this. Uh, this is the the battery park. We, um, I got uh, the commission to do a horticultural master plan for that area. There was a master plan, uh, the infrastructure for the infrastructure. That was creating a a, a park here. I was asked to do a. Uh, a garden of remembrance for the victims of 9-11 here and do a horticulture master plan for the whole area and a bikeway gardens that are not done yet but they are connecting the Hudson to the East River so that is for next year I'm still so you see you start in 2002 and you're still uh, involved in the whole project because uh, we worked on the Hudson on the bay you see, it's a great, I, I didn't realize, but this is how it looked like before they started to redo the garden. And this, they, it was, when they did the garden, it was full of petunias. On this uh, first garden I did, the Gardens of Remembrance. And this is uh, uh, the first season we changed this planting into a more dynamic planting with bulbs and, and grasses. This was the interior, they call it the bosk. This is two years later. You see, we can change uh, stone into uh, green. It's no magic, it's just a matter of money. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> energy, of course. You see, this is uh, how, how it works. Uh, people uh, love to go through there. There's millions of people that cross that area because there's uh, the Staten Island uh, ferries, there's the Statue of Liberty. Ellis Islands, there was millions of people that crossed that park. So what I was afraid of was that there uh, uh, should be so much stress that the park would be ruined within a few years. But it's also still there. So, but that's what I, I this is also how it looked like. So you can see the difference. Huh? That was uh, maybe 15 years ago and this is uh, now and winter. Uh, one in England, so Trendham Gardens, I don't know Okay, yes, yeah. this is how it looked. There was a big, large estate. Um, Tom Stuart Smith, English landscape designer, architect, asked me to join him in this project because it was so big that uh, he wanted to do this uh, Italian garden. He renovated it, but he said, uh, if I could do the, the wings, he called it the wings, so I, if I could do this sort of uh, uh, put this work together within the two borders I could make there. You see, this is what I did. The Tisca, Canamina, you know, there's a plant like uh, an Eupatorium, tall, robust plants. But there was another area that they wanted me to do, that was the uh, there was an old bandstand, which, and a lot of conifers, and I just, we, uh, by talking, we could get out a lot of the things that were grown or overgrown and not uh, not so nice for uh, what I had in mind. I had in mind to do something more. Uh, there was a flood uh, problem in the summer. The River Trent could go out of its borders and could uh, uh, flow into the garden for a few days. So you had to be aware of what plants you would choose. That was one part. That this was the flood part, which we used. Uh, uh, you see, it's a very sort of big gesture, but still there's a lot of plants involved that flower before the grasses come up. You see, this is how it looks in summer. So all the plants, there's irises, there's uh, persicaria, bistorta, there's astilbis, everything. There's uh, maybe 20 plants involved, but they all disappear among the grasses. Uh, and then we have the other area that uh, is more uh, an interior garden where you move through taller plants and uh, yeah, get another 
idea about where you are. You, in fact, you don't have an idea where you are because you're lost. Uh, uh, it is right. You get lost in it. But you see, this is how it looks. And now I want to just uh, show you, um, that is my last work. We, although we started in 2005, my first visit, I was asked by James Corner. Um, they were in, in the competition with three people still for the High Line. And I wanted someone who was horticulturally uh, sort of trained or, or uh, 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 not trained, but um, able to, uh, to, to be part of this competition because it was two and a half kilometer long railroad, you see, from Gansevoort till 32nd Street. So two and a half kilometer of planting design and maybe not so wide. But in fact, it was big and it was a sort of something public that I had never done before. But you see, it was what it was, an old railroad where people, uh, the, the food was brought into New York. And some people uh, sneaked in when it was derelicted, when, when the trains didn't come into New York anymore. And, uh, and two guys rescued it and with all sort of lawsuits and, and people that had rights on this, uh, proper, uh, property rights along the High Line, uh, they, 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 they managed to get, uh, to get it done that there was a competition and, and that they got the sort of possibility to make the garden. So, of course, all about biodiversity. Uh, of course, it works, you know, it's all about what, what happens in, in life circles. But this is where architects came up with. So that's how you win a competition by, you know, by uh, uh, accelerate your ideas into things that can't happen. Uh, but you see, uh, also here, there's a lot of uh, things that you probably won't see. So you can go through the water, there's some ice skating on it. And, uh, but in fact, uh, they won the competition because most of it was about plants and what will grow here. So the whole idea of what uh, uh, that fell in good earth with the, with, the, with, with, the, with the client. So the client were the two guys and the committee and, and the neighborhood. So this is how we saw it the first time. So it was still, uh, uh, it was still in production with all these meat, meat people and uh, we could go up in here and then came up here and that's where the, you know, the, where, where the, the meat was brought in or brought out into the trains. That was our first meeting in 2005. You see that uh, you, yeah, that's James Corner. He was thinking, what am I going to do? <laughs> but you see the railroads were still there and I, I, they said, what can we do here? And I said, yeah, you ha if you want, if you make a garden, you have to take everything out. And that is because they were arguing about the fact that we probably could uh, leave it and probably could, uh, 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 you know, work around uh, the plants. Say, yeah, if you want to make a garden with all the safety uh, uh, reglements and 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 the plantings, you cannot just change your soil uh, and leave everything. So, and and they had to make it wa uh, waterproof and seal. Like you see here, the so um, the design was made, and my task was just to um, to interpretate the ideas of the the landscape architect. So we have this Gansevoort woodland. And, uh, and Tiffany Foundation Overlook. So that is, this, of course, a sponsor. You can imagine that they, they donated a few million to do this overlook. Uh, but we, the idea of, the, uh, of the, the architect was that, you know, we go from woodland into grasslands and a woodland edge. And then we go uh, have the Hudson River Overlook and uh, where we couldn't, uh, we couldn't hide it. So we had to work with less trees or, or lower perennials and then the northern spur preserve if, uh, preserve and that was a place where we only had uh, uh, 20 centimeters of soil and no more so we had to work with something very uh, uh, strong uh, aggressive and that's what we did so we worked with a, a sort of very uh, with almost 100 percent native plants that were very aggressive and could beat each other out on this area but they still are fighting, so it's still there uh, after five years, and it looks good. But you see, then we have the Avenue Square, the Chelsea Grasslands, and the Dillier from Furstenberg Sundeck. And I, I think uh, it might be good to see how uh, this you have seen. So we started with this design, and, and you see with this matrix where we put all these individual plants in. 
So everything was taken out, everything was sealed, made safe for the public and brought in back. So not everything was brought back, but uh, partic uh, let's the, the rail that came back, that was on the, on the, say, the rails came on the back on the same place. And, uh, and this is uh, after planting. So the gravel was brought in because it reminded you of old rail yards. So the, that is, it's not that all plants like it, but uh, uh, and they say it's what against weeds, uh, of course, but also some plants don't like the gravel on top of it. So that is... Uh, um, on the other hand, after the design, you see these are birch trees. There's some, the, the Amsonia, Salvia. Some plants can see themselves. Uh, with this design, I uh, allowed myself, uh, uh, of I allowed the, the, let's say, the planting to do a little bit uh, of their own. So we take action when things are really wrong, going wrong. So we uh, we worked in a way that plants would just sort of very uh, much uh, uh, equal competitive. So they would not. You know, the, I didn't use uh, species that would overrun other species in this area. You see a lot of basic plants like uh, Carex. Carex is a big uh, item in, uh, in North America. They have a lot of varieties which are real good garden plants. I'm amazed that we don't see. We only see a sort of uh, 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 maybe three species or varieties in, in nurseries. And then two of them are variegated. While there are so many green ones that are excellent ground covers especially for woodland. But that we used a lot, and we used uh, climbers going over the, uh, over the railing, hanging into the streets from uh, uh, Schizophragma. And we have some uh, Wisteria, but uh, Wisterias that don't, not Sinensis, but Frutescens, an American species that doesn't grow so fast. Art is part of the garden. And you see that works, they have programs, art programs. You see it's, it looks very natural because of this matrix, you know, this sort of basic planting. Small shrubs appear. And the winter, how it looks like. Hotels are built, there's a lot of building around it. The second part, that was near where the hotel was. You see that's, this is how it looks now. So you can see that uh, it's a complete difference, that nothing has stayed. This is from above. You see the, 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 the infrastructure is, is quite a good, uh, very good design because they had a lot of, they respected the railroad, they brought it in back. This is uh, a sort of metaphor for what the, the uh, of what once was the, the high line. Let's see, this is uh, the part, the sun deck, the von Furstenberg sun deck. And this is the overlook here. You see how it's uh, a complete metamorphosis. This is with the sunsets in New Jersey. And it's really true that happens no, not only there, uh, it happens a lot there. The light is quite nice. This is Kensafort, so we have the Kensafort Meadow after the from Furstenberg Sundeck. This is the Northern Spur, where I told you where we had only very little soil. Where I showed you this. This is in summer, you see. This is in autumn with uh, Solidago and Aster. Winter, it looks very rough, it is rough. But there's a lot of plants that survive, uh, like the Yugera filosa, survives underneath and it comes back. There's some sedum ternata which comes back. We lost the uh, Nepita, the Nepita, the uh, Siberica. This is another place. You see, this is the main entrances that you can go up. Of course, bulbs are very important. Trees and shrubs to create some uh, density. So spontaneity by putting little groups here and there. This is, uh, yeah, in this, uh, you see this is winter, summer. 
This is also this bu these billboards. Uh, every three months they have another billboard. Sometimes it's art. Let's see. Bringing in the plants with the truck. This is summer. I go on because I only have five minutes. <laughs> Uh, just tell it because otherwise you think uh, he, he is uh, out of uh, control. <laughs> <laughs> you see, this is the Chelsea Grasslands section two. That is the we did last year. As you see again, there's, uh, there's conceptual. The uh, there's a, a thicket, so there's more density of trees. There's a, a street lawn. There's a meadow walk. So you see uh, along the way, there's uh, many many different uh, sort of ideas that are translated into a garden. See, this is uh, a more a more cultivated trees as, uh, with roses. This area we uh, they created a flyover with with uh, you can see the trees. That's the bottom. That's uh, ferns and, and ground covers. That's the way we did it. That's the, that's how it looks. So it's very dense with trees. Uh, big magnolias big sassafras and on the bottom we have a lot of ground covering uh, plants uh, that's we come to the end you see it was quite quite nice to walk there when there was nothing you know it's good to be at home and then uh, forget all about it and just start designing and then see how it works out but uh, you see this is uh, you can see that the area is uh, complete a uh, uh, hundred or more percent different you see the piece of the design, so you see this is all, and I, I, I can be honest, this is completely different than what I did before. So during this whole design uh, of the High Line, I changed my, my I, uh, I worked out the idea for myself. I, I stepped over a sort of threshold where my designs became more uncontrollable. Uncontrol uh, in a way, you know that the plants are working well together and that they uh, they, they, the one does, won't push the other out, but still you know that you will lose some here and some other takes over slowly. But, at long, uh, but if, if you accept that and the beauty is there, then it doesn't matter. So that is uh, the state I'm in now. So as long as it stays beautiful, I'm, I'm, I, we keep it. You see, this is uh, how people worked on the High Line before it was there. You see, with the Christmas trees. And uh, so we move further. And this, I think, one of my... Uh, um, I'm surprised myself sometimes on how it works out, because this is one of my favorite uh, areas. Strong grasses, column across the sporobolus, you can see it here, and it sends, it really sends. Uh, I can imagine if you... you we, I used uh, 10,000 on one uh, particular uh, garden in Nantucket, and I, I was... I, 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 it's one of the last stories I tell you, then you get your... Uh, uh, but... Uh, I was dreaming of uh, that they wouldn't like the, the, the sand because I, we just planted 10,000 sporobolus in a private garden. And so I was uh, very afraid when, uh, when, 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 uh, when they started the flower and we, I was there and then I, we went uh, and I thought I still had no comments. So probably they haven't scented it. Uh, but at the end they didn't uh, talk about it at all. Maybe they had no, you know, maybe there was something wrong with the note. But, uh, this is uh, section, um, so here we go into section three. You see, this is still wild. And uh, yeah, we're still working on that and planting it next year. But uh, this is uh, what I had to say for today. Yeah. Yeah.